everyone, this is Tyler Dallas from the FW De Clark Foundation, and you're listening to the Constitution at Work podcast, the series for people interested in constitutional matters and transformation in South Africa. Today, we will be talking about the accountability of public officials with advocate Paul Hoffman. Paul was born in Johannesburg and completed his BA LLB at the University of Advanced in 2006, after 26 years of membership at the Cape Bar, where notably three successive judge presidents of the Cape High Court invited him to grace their bench as an acting judge, he left to take up an appointment as director of the Center of Constitutional Rights. Since January 2009, Paul has been pursuing his commitment to the rule of law and the promotion of constitutional democracy, coupled with his passion for exacting accountability by setting up and working with the Institute for Accountability in Southern Africa, which campaigns as Accountability Now, as its director and head of projects. He has also pursued various human rights and constitutional matters, including the Glenister case, the Armed Steel case, and the Bread case. Paul, thank you for being here this morning. Joining Paul, in this, discussion, joining Paul in this discussion is Mr. Dave Stewart. Dave was born in Nairobi, Kenya, and educated in Canada, the UK, and South Africa. He was a diplomat from 1966 to 1985, serving as ambassador to the UN in 1981 to 1982. He headed the SA Communication Service from 1985 until 1992, when he was appointed Director General in the office of President F.W. de Klerk, where he was closely involved in South Africa's constitutional negotiations. In 1998, he co-authored Mr. de Klerk's autobiography, The Last Trek, and in 1999, established the F.W. de Klerk Foundation together with the former president. He served as its ex-executive director until June 2016 and is now the foundation's chairman. So let's dive straight in. Now, we have a wide array of public officials in South Africa, and exactly as the name suggests, they are there to serve the public. Two public officials currently making headlines are President Ramaphosa for his Pala Pala farm theft allegations, and of course, suspended public protector with the Siwe M. Kobane. So Ramaphosa has confirmed that the theft took place in February of 2020 on his farm as alleged by Arthur Frazier, but he disputes the amount they um, claim to have stolen. The issue is that no criminal case was opened when the incident occurred, which has got members of parliament and the general public questioning an underlying motive. Paul, what is the president's duty in this case? And what oversight would he have as sitting president on any investigation into this matter? Very good question to start off with. You've obviously been doing your homework, Tyler. <laughs> I think that we, we, we need to take a look at the president, not only as our head of state, but also as the chief of the national cabinet, or what you could call the chair of the national cabinet. As head of state, he, he really uh, occupies the position that the queen used to occupy in, in, uh, in the British empire until recently. As the head of the national executive, his role is more like that of a prime minister in the, in the old dispensation. So as the head of state, one, expects of the president that he behaves openly, responsibly, and accountably in all of his dealings, uh, whether in his private capacity or his uh, official capacity. The president, unfortunately, has chosen to be opaque and unaccountable in respect of what has gone on at Parla Parla. He has chosen to invoke the rights of a person who has been accused of a crime. Our Bill of Rights uh, entitles anybody accused of a crime to be uh, in a position to take advantage of the right to remain silent and to insist upon a fair trial in which the right to remain silent can last right up until the end of the proceedings. So what the president has done is to tar himself as an accused in pending uh, criminal proceedings, even though there are no criminal proceedings pending at this stage. And all that we have is a complaint from Mr. Arthur Fraser, 
who as a leading member of the RET faction of the ANC has a massive ax to grind with President Ramaphosa who um, fired him as the chief spook of the nation, uh, made him the, uh, the, the head of correctional services and then let him go shortly after he made that controversial decision to give a medical parole to former President Jacob Zuma, which uh, is still the subject of lit litigation pending in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Thank you, Paul. And I note you say that he's invoking his fair trial rights as an accused. Now, Dave, how would the step aside rule have any bearing on this? Should the president be stepping down while this matter is investigated? Well, Tyler, nobody in our system is above the law. So uh, there are a number of very serious questions that have been raised by the Pala Pala affair. One of them is the fact that the president was in possession of, if not millions, at least several hundred thousand US dollars. And you can't do that in terms of our uh, uh, treasury regulations. So he is certainly in trouble. And, and the manner in which he then dealt with the situation uh, is also very questionable. Now, the, the president has has taken an oath of office in which he is obliged to uphold the law and the constitution. And so he's in a difficult position. He's in a particularly difficult position because Cyril Ramaphosa has really campaigned on the basis of being the guy who's going to end state capture and corruption. It was on this basis that he was elected president of the ANC in 2017 at Nazareth. And he has then taken the lead in, uh, in supposedly restoring integrity to important institutions of government, such as the NPA, and, and supporting the strong principle that anybody who is charged with a criminal offense in the ANC should step aside. So now he is in a situation in the run-up to the ANC's uh, five-yearly national conference, which will take place in December. He's in a very, very difficult position, not only uh, from the point of view of his role as president and chief executive of the country, but also in his position as president of the ANC and aspirant candidate to continue that presidency. So uh, we are in a quandary and he is in a quandary. Now, this isn't the only allegation leveled against the president. Just last week, the Western Cape High Court set aside his decision to suspend former public protector Busitiwe M. Kobane, finding that the decision was unlawful and invalid as it was tainted by bias of a disqualifying kind and perhaps an improper motive. The DA and the president himself have filed an application to leave to appeal this ruling to the constitutional court. Paul, is the decision of the High Court binding? And what are your thoughts on this? No, uh, the, the High Court has no final jurisdiction in any matter relating to the constitutionality of the conduct of a president. That is very clear from uh, section 172 of the constitution itself. So what the high court has done, and it's probably not going to survive an appeal anyway, but even if it does survive an appeal, is to give its opinion in relation to uh, the decision of the president to suspend the public protector. And that opinion will only have any force and effect if in due course, the constitutional court confirms that what the president did in uh, suspending Busisiwe and Kobani uh, was a, a step that is invalid and unconstitutional. So um, I, I don't see that happening. I think that what is required at this stage is very tight case management. The um, effort of the public protector 
to bring herself into a position where she can enforce the um, the ruling made, which is now on appeal and therefore suspended because it's on appeal, um, is 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 in court uh, today, being Friday the sixteenth of uh, September, and um, I I cannot see her succeeding uh, in getting that suspension of the um, of of the order um, successfully in in the, in the hearing today. But what is really required is very efficient and tight case management in the constitutional court so that all of the applications, the counter applications and the interventions by various political parties can be disposed of by the highest court in the land and, and thereby uh, bring an end to the litigation, give or take some frivolous application for rescission, which uh, the public protector is in the habit of doing and doing again. So constitutional law expert Professor Pierre Deport stated in a Daily Maverick article yesterday that courts run the risk of breaching the separation of powers when they invalidate a rationally made decision of the president because of a reasonable apprehension, apprehension sorry, of bias on the part of the president. Dave, what are your thoughts? Is this ruling a breach of the separation of powers? The, the, the reality is that uh, the courts have got a role in also uh, passing judgment on actions that they believe are inappropriate and not in line with the constitution. So I, I think the courts have got, uh, certainly got a role to play in this. But finally, as Paul points out, it will have to be the constitutional court that makes a, a decision on this matter. And the degree to which that is going to succeed will depend on the manner in which it's managed. And it's very important that these issues should be cleared up before the ANC's conference in December, because we are now on the cusp of enormous changes. If if uh, Cyril Ramaphosa doesn't succeed, if the balance of power swings back to those who very nearly dismantled the state under President Zuma, then our struggle for constitutionality and for accountability is going to be very seriously affected. And I'd like to hear what Paul's views are now on that. What are, what are the prospects in future how does he see this thing playing out in the run-up to the, the national conference in December? And what does he think the, the implications will be for the future of accountability and the future of the kind of integrity that we so desperately need in government? Yes, that, that, that's a very big question. And I must agree with you at the outset that the, um, the outcome of the elective conference in, of, of the ANC in December this year is going to be a pivotal event in the uh, development or not of constitutional democracy in South Africa. There are some political observers, and I'm not a politician, who seem to cast uh, Cyril Ramaphosa in the role of constitutionalist and those uh, ranged against him in what is called the radical economic transformation faction of the ANC as the, uh, the, the more radical or revolutionary arm of the ANC. I'm afraid my analysis of his own utterances is that Cyril Ramaphosa is but another disciple of the National Democratic Revolution you will recall that he had a debate with uh, your patron, um, F.W. de Klerk, in the columns of politics where I think in about 2014 or so, where <laughs> uh, President de Klerk had complained that he had not signed up for the National <laughs> Democratic Revolution and um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa sought to persuade the, the readers of politics web that if you support the constitution in South Africa, you are supporting the National Democratic Revolution. I don't think anything could be further from the truth and th that that issue 
is going to have to be faced if South Africa is going to be saved as a social democracy under the rule of law in which the uh, supremacy of the constitution rather than the longing for the revolution is, is uh, the, 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 uh, what informs the government of the day. So what, what we see at this stage is um, a, a tussle within the ANC <laughs> between those who still pretend to uphold the rule of law and the constitution and those like Lindiwe Sisulu who seek to rubbish the constitution and to get on more uh, proactively with the national democratic revolution, which would be disastrous for accountability, responsiveness, the rule of law, and indeed the constitution itself. And uh, that, that um, tension is already showing itself in the actions that are taking place right now. More and more candidates are uh, putting their hand up to succeed uh, President Ramaphosa after only one term as, as president. President Ramaphosa himself has just created the National Anti-Corruption uh, Advisory Council, nine uh, uh, persons who are, are, are now tasked for the next three years with the business of uh, preparing the state for the proper implementation of a national anti-corruption strategy, which uh, sometimes involves uh, reform and other times involves throwing more money at the problem, depending on uh, which day of the week it is and who you're speaking to at any given time. And all of that flying in the face of a, an August 2020 resolution by the National Executive Council of the ANC, which is its highest decision-making body between conferences in which it called for something that walks like a duck, swims like a duck and quacks like a duck and sounds very much like the um, chapter nine integrity commission that uh, accountability now has been championing and advocating for more than 10 years. So I, I think we, we, we really are in a, um, a critical, moment in the development of constitutional democracy in South Africa. So let's move on to the ever controversial Western Cape Judge President John Flaubert. The JSC had advised the President to suspend Judge Flaubert after it had found him guilty of gross misconduct for attempting to influence two retired constitutional court judges in a matter involving former President Jacob Zuma in 2008. Now, Section 177, subsection 3 of the Constitution confers power to the President to suspend a judge found guilty of gross misconduct by the JSC, yet no action has been taken. Paul, this is a topic you have written on extensively. In your opinion, what are the problems with the judicial misconduct system, and what should the President do in this case? Yes, I think that the JSC is probably one of the most um problematic institutions created by our new constitution. There are too many politicians on the JSC and too few uh, judges, especially retired judges, who would know the players that are being judged when the role of the JSC in relation to the appointment of judges is undertaken. When it comes to the disciplining of judges, especially, sadly, black judges, we seem to find that equality before the law gets thrown out of the window and kid gloves are donned by the disciplinary tribunals and processes of the Judicial Service Commission for the purpose of making life as uh, pleasant as possible for those facing disciplinary charges. So for example, the drunken driver uh, just, Justice uh, Mutata in, in Gauteng was, was placed on fully paid suspension for years while his drunken driving case trundled its way through the lower courts and he was found guilty of drunken driving and treated with kid gloves again when freedom under law suggested that uh, lying about being drunk in charge of a vehicle was a good enough reason to deprive him of his pension. That uh, issue 
is is um, still pending before the courts and with with Schlorpe, it's the same again he is not a, a stranger to disciplinary proceedings he was disciplined in the past with one of those gentle um, slaps on the wrist when he did a bit of moonlighting and a bit of bad mouthing and a bit of uh, race baiting and all sorts of um, re really irregular um, behavior. And had he been properly disciplined way back then, uh, we, we might not be sitting in the situation that 14 years after he really committed the crime of attempting to defeat the ends of justice and still uh, swans around as the leader of one of the biggest divisions in the country, uh, polluting the, um, the quality of justice that is dispensed in his court. The three judges who sat in the matter concerning the suspension of Mkubani were all people handpicked by him. And they admit as much. The one was his attorney, the other was plucked from obscurity by him, and the, the, the third was, was a, a, a fellow of his at university. Uh, that, that sort of uh, gerrymandering of the court hearing a matter as important as the fate of the uh, public protector is not what uh, we had in mind when we created an independent and impartial judiciary in South Africa. Thank you, Paul. So staying with that topic of the impartiality and quality of rulings then coming out of the Western Cape High Court. Dave, what are your thoughts on this matter? Well, um, there is a lot of criticism of uh, the, the state of democracy in South Africa. A lot of people are beginning to look at South Africa as a failed state, but I disagree. I think that uh, it is reassuring that our constitution is still in place. We still have uh, judgments from our highest court that displease the government and that the government listens to and obeys. Now that is really, really an achievement for a country like ours, an, an emerging, very young democracy. So the, the future of this country will be determined by the degree to which we can keep this constitution in place, the degree to which we can continue to follow the rule of law and the supremacy of the constitution. And those things are now all in the balance. Uh, as I see it, in the months that lie ahead and in the outcome of the, of the, the National Elective Conference of the ANC in December. So this is the time for all good men to rally around the Constitution and the principle of accountability. So why was former Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, Mahoueng Mahoueng, who was similarly found guilty of misconduct for involving himself in political controversy, dealt with differently to Judge Klope. Are the cases distinguishable from one another in terms of accountability, Paul? No, they're not distinguishable. And uh, Mahoueng um, was not facing a, 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 what you would call a serious case of judicial misconduct. He, he was being um, treated as a misdemeanor rather than as a crime, whereas what Schlopi has done is in fact a crime on the way that the tribunal has uh, assessed the evidence in the matter. So um, the, the, the fact that the Mokweng Mokweng matter was, was disposed of uh, relatively quickly and that he gave the apology that was required um, is, is, is an indication that the system can work but not when the person on the carpet is treated as royal game by the Judicial Service Commission. And Mukweng Mukweng uh, was not given royal game treatment when, when he was um, uh, put on the carpet for his um, pro-Israeli uh, comments, which were unfortunate because it, it, it did contravene the code of conduct of judges because he, he got himself involved from a religious perspective in a political question. And uh, that 
was something up with which the Judicial Service Commission was not prepared to put. So let's end off talking about an article that I saw of yours yesterday in the Daily Maverick Hall on Becky Tsele and the accountability that should be happening with the Minister of Police. Uh, what do you want, what comments do you have on that? What accountability should be happening? Well, I've, I've used that um, uh, case where Becky Chaley was involved in negotiating leases at three times the going rate, uh, was the subject of adverse findings about his honesty and his competence, and in, in respect of whom a recommendation was made by the Malloy Board of Inquiry that he be investigated for corrupt activities. That's clearly a corrupt activity if you negotiate a lease at three times the going rate, because somebody is going to be unjustly enriched out of the payment of the rentals out of the public purse for the police headquarters involved. And Becky Chaley, this all happened around the World Cup in 2010, and Becky Chaley has led a charmed life ever since. The matter was initially referred to the Hawks, and the Hawks are the investigative successor of the Scorpions. Scorpions were disbanded the minute Jacob Zuma came into power because they were getting in the way of his state capture plans, the plans that he hatched during the course of his two terms uh, in office as president of South Africa. The, um, the initial investigation of Chele was, was thwarted when the uh, Serious Commercial Crimes Unit said, I'm sorry, uh, Hawks, you haven't got this right. We can't see that there is a, a proper case to answer here. We're not going to prosecute. And there the matter lay until the investigative directorate of the um, National Prosecuting Authority was created by President Ramaphosa in 2019. He did it by proclamation and his expressed aim for that was to get cases exactly like that pending against Becky Chele dealt with by an institution with a, a bit more independence and a lot more clout than the Hawks have ever been able to bring to bear. The Hawks have never caught a big fish in, when it comes to um, investigation of serious corruption. They do good work on uh, things, things like human trafficking and uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 the work around uh, poaching, rhino poaching in particular, there they, they can get on with it. But when it comes to um, matters in which politics are involved, the, the, the Hawks have been singularly unsuccessful for the entirety of their existence. And the, the difficulty that I raise in the article in The Maverick is that Having got to the point where we now have in, an investigative directorate in the um, National Prosecuting Authority, we took the matter up with the National Director of Public Prosecutions, who immediately understood that there is a problem about asking the Hawks to investigate the minister to whom they answer. And she gave instructions during a, a, a sort of greet the civil society organizations webinar that she organized. And um, nothing came of, of, of uh, the investigation. We fed uh, information and paperwork and reports to the, um, uh, the investigative directorate while Hermione Cronier was in charge there. She left, she was asked to leave and, and agreed to go. And she's been replaced by Andrea Johnson and um, Johnson's attitude, very strange. He makes promises to come back to us about what's going on, doesn't come back, doesn't apologize, doesn't ask for extensions in time. And eventually, after we report her to the public protector's office, because she is guilty of uh, maladministration of her interaction with us, she comes back and says, no, she's looked at the papers and she's sending it back to the to the Hawks, which is really an exercise in futility and an overreach on her part because she can't just do that. The case was given to her or to her unit 
by the National Director of Public Prosecution. So the theme that I am uh, pursuing with that story is that our anti-corruption machinery of state, whether you look at the investigative capacity or the prosecutorial capacity, is just not up to scratch. And it will remain not up to scratch until there is radical reform of the criminal justice administration by the establishment of a chapter nine institution, which we like to call the Integrity Commission because the, uh, the, the negative connotations of calling it the uh, Commission Against Corruption are particularly unfortunate when you uh, use, use the acronym in Afrikaans. So the, the outcome of the, um, the, the interaction, or lack of interaction with the NPA is that we seek to demonstrate through that real live example that the NPA itself is no longer up to the task of taking on serious corruption and a new institution to prevent, combat, investigate and prosecute serious corruption is what is required. You can leave cool drinks full of traffic cops and petty corruption in the hands of the NPA and the Hawks. There's no problem with that. The Hawks have got lots of other priority crimes to look at. But when it comes to serious corruption and cases involving serious corruption where there's racketeering and fraud, uh, theft, uh, all of those can profitably be put in the hands of what some people call the super scorpions, um, a, a, an institution that both investigates and prosecutes serious corruption. There, there was a, a conference this week uh, run by the Public Affairs um, Research Institute and WITS where the, um, the, the topic was discussed further. And if this is our last question today, we might well consider having a deeper dive into the need for reform of the Criminal Justice Administration. We say that that need is more than a need, it's an obligation because the Glenister litigation, which was waged um, between well, we got, we got judgments in it in 2011 and 2014. And those judgments are binding on the state. So it's not that there's a need to reform. There's actually an obligation to comply with the criteria that have been set in the Glenister litigation. And it's very clear, the, the NPA admits that it's got a, a backlog of over 10 years of work to do on corruption. And the Chief Justice who sat in the State Capture Commission says, it will be necessary to have an army of prosecutors to get on with the individual cases that he has identified in his uh, huge report on state capture. And that's not going, those, uh, the, the people with the skills to do what is required to, to hold the corrupt to account are not to be found within the NPA and they are not ever going to be uh, recruited by the NPA while it is in its hollowed out, saboteur riddled state as a consequence of the, the ravages of state capture and the uh, gerrymandering of Jacob Zuma. So those, those problems are, are going to be with us for a while yet. And um, we, we, we're going to have to uh, really give serious consideration to taking them back to the court to say, this is what you asked government to do. This is what's happened since then. Very clearly, the, the, uh, the system as it is operating does not work. Your order is not being implemented as it should be. And we want you to now take charge of this and get uh, functioning anti-corruption machinery to deal with serious corruption in South Africa. Thank you, Paul. And I agree, definitely another podcast on reform would be great. 
So let's close off with um, a comment that was also made in this article by you, that SAP's management has been the locus of an unbridled cadre deployment that has resulted in the militarization and incapacitation of its personnel as a crime fighting unit, exactly like you just alluded to with the NPA. Um, Dave, what are your comments on this? Specifically, how cadre deployment, um, let me try and rephrase this, how accountability is impacted by cadre deployment? Well, Tyler, I, I couldn't agree more with Paul about the need for an independent integrity commission with all of the powers of a Chapter 9 institution. However, the problem, as always, lies with the will of the politicians who run the country. And the outcome of that question will be determined at the ANC's national conference in December. If the majority there of delegates don't want an effective anti-corruption mechanism for a whole variety of reasons, it's probably not going to happen. And so that is why it remains so essential for civil society, for the media to keep on focusing on these core issues uh, that without which our constitutional state cannot work. So we should all be struggling for an integrity commission, but we have to watch what happens in December at the ANC's national conference. Thank you, Dave. Thank you both for being here this morning. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this episode of the Constitution at Work. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications to be alerted when our next video is up. If you, have see, if you have any feedback on today's episode, please feel free to have your say in the comments section. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at FW Declark Foundation to keep up with our latest news. We look forward to checking in again soon. Bye.